This is Season 1, Episode 38, and you are listening to an After Dinner Conversation magazine podcast. After Dinner Conversation believes humanity is improved by ethics and morals grounded in philosophical truth, and that truth is discovered through intentional reflection and respectful debate. In order to facilitate this process, we've created a growing series of print books, a monthly short story magazine, and two different podcasts. This podcast, Philosophy Ethics Short Story Audiobooks, provides audiobook readings of stories that have appeared in our magazine, and our companion podcast, Philosophy Ethics Short Story Discussions, is where we discuss the ethics of the choices made in the stories as a way to model the kinds of discussions we hope you're having about these readings with friends, family, or students. We would love it if you'd go over and check out our companion podcast, and of course, you can always continue the discussion on our webpage, in the comment section, or on our Facebook page. I'm Colby, your narrator, and the creator of After Dinner Conversation Publishing. Thank you for spending your time listening to our podcast and for reading the magazine. Thank you for supporting us through your magazine subscriptions and through patreon.com forward slash After Dinner Conversation. And of course, if you enjoy this audiobook reading, Please subscribe to our podcast, share it on social media, and suggest it to friends. Today's story was in our June 2021 magazine, uh, and it is by Jan Everard. The name of the story is I Do So Like Duran. The 504 streetcar grated against the curve of the tracks as it entered the station. It pulled to a stop directly in front of Holly. The doors opened with such a clunk that she stepped back, treading on the toes of the person behind her. She was blocking the door. A crowd of restless Chinese grandmothers nudged her forward with sharp elbows. Does this car go south on Broadview, she asked the driver. He adjusted his seat and the booklet of transfers clipped to the dash. He didn't bother to look at her. 504 turns at Queen, 505 at Dundas, he said. But does it go south, she persisted, and he flicked a thumb to the back of the car, signaling for her to board. She had never been to Broadview Station before. She rarely used public transit. Her high school was within walking distance of her house, and her mother was happy to drive her wherever she and her friends wanted to go. I don't like you girls alone on public transit, she'd say the slight wrinkle of her nose suggesting that the matter wasn't so much about safety. Besides, driving together gives us a little time to chat. She would perch on the edge of Holly's bed until the silence from Holly's friends went on a little too long. Somewhere south of the station was the restaurant where John worked. Holly had tried to tease the name out of him, but he'd evaded her. It's downtown, not anywhere near where you live, he'd say. Besides, you told me you only liked sushi and Italian from the village. She pressed, scooting closer to him on the bench in the library, where she kept him company while he studied at lunch. I just want to know where you are on Friday night, she said, her hand brushing his arm. His temptation was palpable, but while Holly silently pleaded for him to make a move, his lips stayed grimly set and his attention returned to his textbook. It's on Broadview, near Gerard, he conceded. East Chinatown. Her mother would never agree to drive her there. She hated Chinese food and had always rejected the idea of trying dim sum when Holly had suggested it. God knows what goes in those odd-looking dishes, she said. Chinatown's everywhere smell of dried shrimp and rotting vegetables, and the people are loud and pushy, and... She'd caught herself then, perhaps realizing how she sounded, or that negativity made her inelegant. I don't like that neighborhood, Holly dear. But Holly liked John liked the leanness of him, the smooth tofi of his skin, and the taut arrow of his ambition. It felt as if he had bypassed the teenage years and already knew something more about life. With John, she could almost see herself as an adult, confident, knowing. With him, a relationship could move past Friday nights chilling with friends, vodka shots, and inexperienced groping. Holly texted Sasha to tell her, She'd left Broadview Station and eyed the people around her to see if there was anyone she knew, anyone that might report Holly's whereabouts to her mother, 
who would surely ground her for lying or impose a curfew. Sasha had agreed to be her cover if Holly's mom got unexpectedly curious, but only on the condition that Holly texted every detail every evening. She was thumbing a long message about the rude driver when she heard the streetcar's announcement system call out Queen Street. The driver had said the car turned to Queen. She rushed to the front. Have you passed Gerard? On Google Maps, Broadview Avenue had appeared long. She'd been so focused on her text to Sasha that she hadn't noticed how fast the car was moving. Gerard was a couple of streets back, said the driver, his tone flat, his eyes dead ahead. He sounded the bell and swore lightly at some rowdy pedestrians who swarmed off the sidewalk at the Queen Street corner, blocking what was already a tight turn. As he waited for people to move, he said to Holly, You can walk back. It'll only take about ten minutes. He opened the door and let her out, taking advantage of the opportunity to call, Get out of the way, you crazy bunch of drunks! Holly sidestepped a group loitering in the glow of a street lamp, avoiding eye contact. When she looked up, she was in front of three girls with large, exposed breasts, postered on a brick wall. A couple of guys in toques smoked nearby. Their eyes raked over her, brash, hungry, but dismissive. Above their heads, Jilly's exotic dancing glowed in neon. Holly turned on her heels to cross the street, clutching harder to her coach bag, running to catch the last few seconds of the warning countdown of the pedestrian light. The pattern of black and white splotches painted on the outside of the restaurant on the opposite corner was meant to suggest the hide of a Holstein and, by extension, beef burgers, she guessed. As Holly passed the steamed-up windows, she glimpsed five or six patrons inside laughing while making crude sexual gestures and planned to text Sasha that all the people on this corner were lowlifes. For now, though, it was better to keep her phone in her pocket. She took a glimpse at her watch, 8.30. She still had time to find John's restaurant. He wasn't off work until 9, although he told her that even after he'd finished serving customers, there was plenty of work to do, and he wouldn't be able to meet her. If you're off work, you should be able to go, she pointed out, and he looked at her. Was that look in patience? She couldn't always tell what John was thinking and said, I'm expected to stay. Holly twitched the zipper of her jacket a little higher. It was a crisp evening, and she was wearing only a bra top with spaghetti straps underneath. Her friends, Sasha too, would be going to an all-ages dance club later, near where she lived in Midtown. She'd put on the top, hoping that John might agree to meet her friends there, to take a break, for her sake. She wanted him to dance with her, to hook up with her, finally, or they could go someplace else. It didn't really matter as long as they spent part of the evening together. Up until now, they had mainly walked in the neighborhood parks during spares, talking about college, life after high school. The top's tight fabric, rubbing against her nipples, made her feel self-conscious and more forward than she'd intended. What if people walking toward her could tell how little she had under her zipped-up jacket? What if John thought her outfit was over the top for a first date, slutty even? She kept her hand on the zipper of her expensive jacket, her arm hiding its logo. Not far from the cow restaurant, she noticed a northbound streetcar stop. She had no tickets or tokens, only three $20 bills her mom had given her for the weekend. Public transit drivers didn't make change. She'd have to walk. Her feet didn't hurt too badly yet, despite her heeled boots. Ten minutes, the driver had said. Acrid smoke from a cigarette made her speed up past a woman sitting on a cement half wall. The woman had no coat and pulled on the cigarette so hard her cheeks caved hollowly. The aroma of fresh bread flowered the air and voices drew her attention to a bakery with its front door open. An Asian man in a dirty apron stood outside facing the street, backlit by the bakery lights. He was young and looked a little like John. Like John, but not as attractive. Gerard's not far, is it? she asked. Yeah, yeah, he replied as if chewing on the word. First you go right. He gestured with his hand northward, and then with a small head bobble to the left said, and then you go right. These directions confused her, but she decided not to press. Two very tall men in the bakery were looking her way, eyes narrowed. She was interrupting their work. After the bakery, 
Holly passed a row of six Victorian row houses with stained glass windows and wrought iron fences, a low apartment block, a school. This felt better. The houses were narrow, a quarter of the size of the homes in her neighborhood, but they had nice gardens. But then the businesses got shabby again. A few were permanently closed. The smell of garbage, heaped in piles, permeated the air, as did cooking oil. Looking down a few stairs directly to her right, there was a bent woman in a hairnet carrying an industrial-sized tray, dumplings made in a basement. Her mother's words came back to her. Ahead was a corner variety store, a Subway sandwich joint, a single man in a dark hoodie shrouded by the scented smoke of marijuana, standing in front of the kind of coffee place Holly would never enter, the lowest of the coffee franchise food chains. The strip was otherwise deserted. Holly's footsteps echoed alone. This couldn't be where John worked, not near an area like this. Where were the shops and clothing stores? Her cell phone vibrated in her pocket, but she didn't dare remove it. She hadn't texted her friend in ten minutes or more. Sasha would be wondering why. Knowing Sasha was waiting for her to make contact gave her courage. With one press of a button, she could have her on speakerphone. She could tell her that this place was seedy or not. She could handle this alone. Sasha didn't have to know everything. In the block above Dundas were a mission-run second-hand shop and unkept businesses that had signs in Chinese with English translations beneath. The 505 streetcar sped south and squealed as it took the corner onto Dundas headed west. It blew dried leaves across the pavement and stirred up a grit storm in its wake. An ugly institutional block of what could only be subsidized housing butted up to the sidewalk, small high windows hung with red and gold medallions. She looked at them knowing she had no idea if they were religious or merely decorative. John would know. She'd ask him. She could finally see the streetlights of the broadview Gerard intersection ahead. The block was bright with signs, red on yellow, yellow on red, all in Chinese characters. It was crowded. The sidewalk narrowed by more garbage bins and collapsed cardboard boxes on the left, and people and produce spilled out of the stores on the right. A friend had said there were only a few restaurants on Broadview that most faced Gerard. Holly's plan had been to unobtrusively look in each one until she found John, but there was no way she could be unobtrusive here. This was not what she'd expected. She didn't know what she'd expected. She'd expected something different, more familiar than this. It hadn't occurred to her that John's life was so connected to his cultural roots. He went to her school, after all, in a neighborhood far from this. Lots of kids did travel from around the city to her school, smart kids, gifted kids like John. It had always been his smartness, his studiousness, that had defined him, not his Asianness. She stopped before she had waited too far up the block and looked up at the signs again. Sing Barbecue Restaurant. Ka Ka Lucky Seafood Barbecue Restaurant. She looked at that one again. Had they no idea? Poor John, if he worked at the Ka Ka Lucky Seafood Barbecue Restaurant. She was pushed closer to a tier of boxed fruits and vegetables. Next to her was a pile of large football shapes. She didn't know if they were fruits or vegetables. They looked armored, covered in dull, drab-colored spikes. She turned to a fellow who was stacking oranges and gestured. What is this? she asked. He answered, but she couldn't mimic his response. Pardon? she prompted. A younger woman beside her answered. It's Duran. Smell. She held one of the fruits closer to Holly's nose, and even as it approached, she could tell she was going to gag from the odor. The woman looked away, smirking a little. Holly straightened her shoulders and glared at the woman. If she didn't know a Duran, it wasn't because she was ignorant or disinterested. She wanted to know Duran, and that stack of tubers there, and that heap of green vegetables next to her here. Defiant, she grabbed a plastic bag from the roll above the oranges and shoved into it the largest Duran from the pile, nodding the plastic closed. She strode into the store and held out a 20 to the young girl at the till, who took the bill and returned to change without expression. The next business was a small restaurant. It glowed with the bluish light of old-fashioned fluorescent tube lighting. The walls were the color of a school bathroom, 
The tables streaked to show the direction of each wipe of a dirty washcloth. Four or five patrons sat scattered around the room, watched over by a woman who stood with her weight shifted onto her right hip as if it were too painful or required too much energy to stand straight. High in the window hung dead birds, their cooked skins glistening and crisp. At the back, in a filthy apron, stood John, his expression closed. The plastic tube he held brimmed over with dishes smeared with jellied sauce and flecks of rice and noodle. A door beside him was propped open to reveal the carcass of a pig hanging in its entirety from a metal hook in the ceiling. For a second, panic brewed in Holly's stomach. She desperately wanted to be somewhere else, someplace dim, someplace anonymous. Just to think about what all this meant, to practice a reaction. But what reaction? John wasn't wearing the white shirt, black pants uniform of the servers at the kind of restaurant she was used to, but cheap, shiny polyester. The smells weren't anything she was used to either. The area was poor and chaotic, the restaurant plain. But it was also exotic. Her parents had never brought her to a place like this. She'd arrived here by herself, her choice, and everything was so totally outside her experience that it felt like a small act of rebellion. Liking John had already made her see differently in some ways. Before she'd met him, her future had felt blurry with the soft edges of entitlement. His was sharply defined by a hunger to get on with it, to make life happen. Success wasn't inevitable in John's mind. It had to be manufactured. That's what made him so attractive to Holly, the intensity with which he worked for what he wanted. She wanted him to show that same intensity to be with her. She'd show him she could step up to the challenge, too. The defiance that had compelled her to buy the Duran propelled her through the restaurant's front door. John looked up, his forehead furrowed. What are you doing here, he asked. His embarrassment stiffened her resolve. I'd like to eat. She glanced at the woman. I'd like to try this. I hope it doesn't need much cooking. She held out the plastic bag containing the Duran. This set off a loud flurry of conversation between the woman and John. She waited. Is your boss okay with that? She's not my boss. She's my mother. You won't like the flavor of this. John peeled off his apron and approached, reaching for the bag. It was heavy. Her shoulder was beginning to ache from holding it out. She turned towards John's mother. I'm Holly. I'm pleased to meet you. She doesn't speak English. He held the bag gingerly. This, he considered, his glance bouncing around the room, is an acquired taste. I'd like to try it anyway. Incredibly, her sense of confidence kept growing. How do I say hello to your mother in her language? John shook his head. He pulled out a chair. Sit here. I'll prepare it for you. Holly ignored him, smiling hard at his mother. But I'd like to see how to prepare it myself. Can I go to the kitchen with you? She made gestures, pointing at the back, mimicking the slice of a knife, holding John's mother's eyes, trying to win her over. The woman, who had straightened, grew animated. She thrust her chin at the back of the restaurant, and chattered to John. He argued, but relented once she moved toward him, sweeping them toward the kitchen door with flicks of her hands. Holly grabbed the discarded apron from the back of the chair where John had dropped it and pulled it over her head. He was ahead of her, leading the way to the kitchen. As she was about to pass the pig carcass, she stopped, put her hands on its sides, and did a little dance step that made the carcass sway on its hook. She didn't bother to look back into the restaurant. If anyone asked her about her evening, she could say she had gone dancing. But what anyone thought if they saw her here didn't really matter anymore. The End Discussion Question Number 1 Holly's mother seems to have an exceptional dislike for Chinese culture in Chinatown. Why do you think that is? Why doesn't Holly share that dislike? Question two. Holly seems to find Chinatown interesting and is willing to embrace it. Would her mother's reaction be different? If so, why? Question three. 
Does it matter that Holly's reason to expand her cultural horizon is simply to talk to a boy she's interested in? Are there better or worse reasons to try new things? Question 4. What keeps Holly's mother from embracing new experiences? Is there anything you can do to keep that from happening to you? Question 5. When Holly's mother finds out Holly went to Chinatown, they will likely fight over it. What will be the result of that fight? What is likely the result of Holly and John's dating? Is it possible for Holly's mother to handle the situation differently or better? If you enjoyed this story, head over to our companion podcast, After Dinner Conversation Discussions, and listen to our discussion of this or other short stories from our magazine. We will include a link in the description. And of course, you can always continue the discussion on our webpage, in the comments section, or on our Facebook page. Join us next week when our story will be In Love and War. Have a great day. Thank you.